Hey, it's Keith. If you're a lover of audio drama like I am, you need to know about the Apollo app. Apollo is designed around audio drama, so finding your next story is easy. You can always listen through Apollo for free, but there's also the Apollo Plus subscription. With it, you get ad-free listening, exclusives, and other bonus content for over 40 shows. And 70% of the revenue on Apollo Plus goes to those creators. Join Apollo Plus through the Apollo Podcasts app or apollopods.com. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of a podcast about audio drama and the creative process. I'm W. Keith Timms, audio drama producer and podcaster. In this show, I listen to the first episode of an audio drama, then have a discussion with the creators about their show, their methods, struggles, and successes. Today, we're discussing the first episode of The Madness of Chartrullian. The Madness of Chartrullian is a political sci-fi epic written and produced by H.M. Radcliffe. Chartrullian is a genetically engineered messiah who, when war came to his people, abandoned a life of piety to build warships of unimaginable power. The war is now over, and diplomacy has begun, but Chartrullian finds himself drawn into politics and power play against his wishes. Moreover, something has gone wrong in his ships and in himself. An uncontrollable, destructive urge is growing within him, and he must reconcile with his past and his consequences before he succumbs to it. Radcliffe runs Pakal Media, a production company, is active on the Audio Drama Lab Discord server, and started the AD Raid program that draws attention to indie audio dramas. I spoke to H.M. remotely from her home in Texas. Before we jump into things, I do want to acknowledge that uh, you and I have worked together on several projects before, yeah. and I've always enjoyed those. We did the Phonic Fiction Fest together in our show, Emmet. I was a voice actor for you in the first Kill FM. And then we are also involved in the Audio Drama Lab as people who sort of help out and work there and hang out there. And so I, I want to say that it's, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you there and working with you. And uh, I'm excited to have you here on the show. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, it, those projects I met and the I, I Dare You is the name of the uh, Kill, uh, yeah. Kill FM entry. It's funny, those those are both produced under such fire. It'd be great yeah. to do something that, you know, had some plans. <laughs> Right. Maybe uh, maybe we do our best work under pressure, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I think so. Well, let's start off with just tell me something about yourself as an artist and creative person. I grew up in rural Illinois, which was very flat and very bleak, very boring. A couple things factored into, I guess, how I how I turned out really in the way I approach and explore the arts was really through kind of a, a lack of them. I thought, Hmm. kind of time in my life right. growing up. So, um, you know, I'm an older millennial. We didn't have technology or a lot of access to the outside world. Things we didn't really access or have access to. When I say we, I really mean me. My brother and sister are both quite a bit older than I am and grew up quite a bit more religious. Hmm. There's, I think, 12 years between me and my sister, eight years between me and my brother. So I really oh, kind of yeah. grew up in a way an only child in the sense of being a child. You know, we didn't have, you know, cable TV for a while. The internet, you know, didn't come until I was in high school. So no cursing, no scary movies, no violence and stuff like that for a lot of that time. But my mom was really good about books and reading books to us and making sure we were exposed to to literature. And so we had Little House on the Prairie and yeah. Inner Green Gables and then um, the Chronicles of Narnia. We even had a back set of the Lord of the Rings BBC audio drama that we would break out on occasion. Nice. So yeah, it was a very, 
I wouldn't call it backwoods, but you know, it was very much a childhood that was fueled by other forms of media and entertainment. And a lot of the kind of downtime was spent just kind of like in my own mind. I was homeschooled for up until about the eighth grade. And so that's really when I started interfacing with other kids and consuming what they consumed and stuff like that. But there were a lot of quiet times and those were times I really spent inside my own head. Being a little, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We weren't very modern. We didn't have a lot of things other people had. But my aunt had a video camera. At any time a project would come up through school, I had figured out by my sophomore year, really junior year, that I was a terrible student and not really academic. I didn't have the attention span or the interest for school. I think I just stopped taking math altogether at like algebra two and nobody noticed. But like... (laughs) The only way I can really get through a lot of my classes, um, history classes and English classes in particular, was through making videos. And so I would go to my aunt's house and borrow her video camera. And then we would run around as like, you know, Antigone or Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and act out our English projects or whatever it was we were working on. Yeah, You know, it was a time again before a lot of kids were doing that. And so we were kind of known for, for doing this, for making these really kind of great entertaining video projects. That's kind of how I started to explore storytelling media. Um, I edited the movies basically using our TV and VCR. And so I I kind of disassembled the entire entertainment center to do these things too. It's like I had our our six, you know, disc changer and our equalizer and everything hooked up, stopping and pressing play and record on the VCR at the right times. I did the same thing when my mom decided that she wanted to present. um, She always worked for radio stations. She wanted to produce a show called I Have a Story, where she would interview a bunch of people from the region, artists, uh, educators, uh, musicians, like, or just anyone with like a crazy story. Like one guy had like an alien abduction story and she wanted to pitch this to her radio station. And so I actually helped her produce a lot of those early episodes of I Have a Story using the same kind of deconstructed stereo system. Did you go to college? I did. So like after all that, I actually used those things. Um, It was my mom's idea to attend Webster University for filmmaking. It seemed like the right fit. And so I used those radio stories and I used my stupid high school projects. Like I think one of them, I was like dressed as a shark. (laughs) Like I, I might have a clip of that I could, you know, (laughs) share at some point, but um Yeah. And so I I actually put those on my um, college application and some music that I'd written, you know, from staying in the band room instead of eating lunch in the cafeteria when I was feeling not so great. No, so kind of like all these (laughs) that were kind of basically the products of like compound childhood trauma. This all went into this film school application and I got in. So how did you make the transition from from that into working on audio drama? I think that a lot of people with a film background come at it in a way that's a little bit different than I feel like I came at it. And I, th- I feel like the assumption is that this is something that's easy to do versus something that's like requires the overhead and all the people and stuff like that oh, for yeah, film. Audio drama has, is a low barrier to entry. It's easier to accomplish yeah. because you don't have all the, the crew and the, and the visual elements and the film and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. And I think that's a very limited way of looking at it, you know, for people who are coming in. And I think there are people who use it as like a, a method to pitch a concept or something like that. And there's nothing wrong with these things. You know, I, I think it's great that people get out there and try the medium. To me, it wasn't really anything having to do with the medium. Um, I think what it was for me really had to do with kind of some of the back end. I had been doing media production for 15 years in various forms as a camera operator, as a video editor, you know, and a director and cinematographer and the independent scenes in St. Louis. And like, I felt like at my mid 30s, I should be at a point where I wasn't justifying myself to be able to reach the next milestone, even if it was like really small. I'm a very shy person. I Mm -hmm. have a lot of social anxiety in where where I really found myself in a world that required more of the Um, Mm go-getter, a lot more of the salesperson. Yeah, I felt like I was stagnating a little bit. Audio drama has a low barrier to entry. You know, all those things are true. But it was really more that like I was craving a storytelling place where no one could stand in front of me and tell tell me what to do. At some point, you formed Pac Media, which is your production company. Yeah, it's my production whatever. 
the Mandis of Chartrillion has been getting some good recognition. You and Realm have partnered. Yeah. So recently we partnered with Realm and they will be distributing basically everything that Packall Media produces. And so the Mandis of Chartrillion got selected for the LA Web Fest this year. So congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're excited. Since you've been working in the indie audio drama field is you started the AD Raid program. Do you want to talk about that? So the idea really belonged to Ian Knowles, who just came through and I think it was like a Twitter circle. And he was like, hey, we should just do like a raid and we should also go raid people's like things. So I was like, cool, I'll do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so like I basically just set up a simple site for him and made a landing page for it just on the Pack Howl Media website. This is a program that highlights a particular indie show or two and yeah. encourages people to go listen and leave reviews and support. So basically, yeah, we, we raid, <laughs> we raid a show. And so I had people signing up and then we were blasting up those shows on our social media channels and encouraging people to go leave their ratings and reviews for those shows. And we went for like a solid few months until I decided that like this was enough of a thing where I could probably give it a little more infrastructure and backbone and kind of look at a few things that we could do a little bit better. So I'm actually working on rebuilding that site and site form right now. And hopefully by this summer, I'll be going again with that. You're pretty active in promoting and supporting the um, indie audio drama community. Why? There's kind of two halves to the answer. I think there's a part that's like really in a way emotional and there's, there's a part of it that's really practical. One of the barriers the audio drama as an industry faces, I think, is just in getting people, you know, the strength and numbers that they need for visibility and that, that holds down everybody trying to do the same thing when no one's looking at audio drama. There's all these wonderful shows going without a lot of support or a strong listenership and they deserve it. The other side of it is people sometimes just need to hear something really nice. <laughs> Why don't we talk about your show for a little bit then? Tell me about the madness of Chartrillion. What does this show mean to you in your own words? I think what ended up happening when I was putting kind of pen to page with the story was really kind of just a way to digest things. When I started writing it in earnest was, you know, during the pandemic, like so many projects. Sure. But I think what was coming out was really the way I was feeling about the world and think, you know, kind of having these thoughts that are so kind of prevalent in the theme, which are, is humanity, I don't want to say, is humanity worth saving, but like to kind of put these words in, some, you know, the mouth of someone else who is qualified to have those thoughts. Yeah. I was kind of looking at our history, you know, a little bit of, you know, previous civilizations, you know, the Holy Roman Empire, yada, 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 and kind of, I was trying to put what was happening in our world in like a broader historical context, I guess you could say. I don't pretend to be a highly literate person. I'm not the person that can sit here and rattle off all the epitetuses and stuff like that, <laughs> you know, in history. Maybe I can take this context and in these kind of these collections of things people have said that I have read and craft around a little bit of mythology, you know, a safe place for me to have these thoughts without feeling like I was getting something wrong. Kind of looking at how we deify in our culture and have like a little more so a few years ago before the purchase of Twitter, you know, people like <laughs> Elon Musk, <laughs> you know, and like all these, you know, kind of hyper billionaires and technologists and, and the, the gravity we as a culture give these people in our society. And then also kind of looking at this evangelical Christian thing you know, that America specifically has going on. I kind of asked myself one day, well, what if the Messiah was like one of these tech deities? And what would that look like? The Madness of Sartrillion, it is a sci-fi epic, broad scope, and deals with large issues and a very wealthy, very powerful uh, people. And it does revolve around Chartrillion, who is a, a messiah figure. He was sort of genetically engineered to be a Superman type. He recently ended a war. He designed nine ships that were so powerful they wiped out the enemy fleet. But his use of this energy, which is called Azuria, uh, did two things. Number one, it upset a lot of people because they believe there is a spiritual component to Azuria. And that also that something went wrong in the construction and that the use of Azuria has created this impulse to destroy that lives inside these ships and in Chartrillion himself, which, that, which is termed the Berserker. It's time to show them what we can do. We need to interlink. What's our target? That big one. If we can take that out, the rest will lose confidence. We're all here. 
we don't push our limits, we're all going to die. Now's not the time for mercy. It's us or them. Remember that. Let's go. Fire. Control! We can't. It's like it's acting on its own. Shall truly, can you stop this calamity? I can try. One of the things I do like about your show is that the characters are written very believably and very human, that even though these are very wealthy and powerful and almost everyone you meet is royalty or uh, highly placed, they still talk and b behave in a very sort of human and approachable way. I mean, there are some great scenery chewing villains, but, you know, Chartrillian himself is this grumpy guy who is just wants to be left alone to do his thing and he, he doesn't want to deal with all this stuff. Yoba is the Chamberlain who is really very likable and um, roll with it kind of guy. In later episodes, King Starbringer is the, he's very affable for being the ruler of all of humanity. He's got that heavy as the head, wears the crown kind of thing. I do think that focusing on the characters as you do, the way they speak to each other and the dialogue, it can be sometimes very funny and very endearing, but also very human, very believable. I think we see enough media that kind of like lean on like the corrupt politician. We see enough that leans on like these kind of cliches and stereotypes to tell these same kinds of stories that I really didn't want to do that. I just can't write those characters. If I can't empathize with them, then they don't really get on the page. Every character I've written has something about them that I can empathize with. And if, if I'm creating a character that like it's just a cliche and I can't get in their head. Like, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Who really holds a lot of power. He still needed to be vulnerable. You know, I tried to kind of really approach this like less as like, what do I think this person would do? But like more of like, well, what kinds of qualities do I have that can be projected onto them so I can understand them better and actually write it? Ah, there he is. The Superman in his natural habitat. Whatever remains of him. Still as dour as ever, I see. Give me an auspicious occasion, and you might find me in a better disposition. Is being reunited with an old friend not sufficient occasion? It is good to see you, Yoba. A long time has passed, hasn't it? I'm not sure if seeing you like this makes me feel younger or older. <laughs> I have little nostalgia for our seminary days. Those were tumultuous times. I'm liking the beard, by the way. It complements your black aura. <laughs> and you are turning grey. Uh, <laughs> uh, us lowly life forms don't age as gracefully as Etruvians. <laughs> Look at all this. Such a crazy ordeal. It doesn't sit well with me. We're supposed to put on a show of confidence. Haven't we already done that? Mm, no, we've shown them power. The rest is up to diplomacy. We won. Just let them leave. They're stuck here unless we can help them leave. We have to learn how this type of diplomacy works while we still have the advantage. I will say this about uh, characters and having vulnerabilities. It, it, you're right. There are tons of the sort of macho, tough guy, never worries about anything. Me, personally, I find a lot of those characters to be really boring. And the reason why is we become interested in characters that have risk, that they have something to lose. If a character has nothing to lose, I don't. why should I pay attention? If, if they don't care, why should I care? When you add vulnerability to a character, suddenly that shows that they have something to lose. And the fact that they overcome these weaknesses makes them all the stronger. You want characters that are vulnerable. That's the interesting stuff. I mean, you can have these huge stakes, you know, these things that are at risk that are like these giant planet killer kinds of conflicts, which, you know, Chartrillian really basically does, you know, right. but it's really the minutia that people find more interesting than like, well, the rabble of the planet up. Like, that's not the thing that keeps people coming back. You know, they're coming back because they saw something in a character and they're, you know, kind of stuck to that. 
the first episode goes all the way from this interaction with a cosmic being somewhere out in you know the void and then you're in space and then like suddenly the last thing you end on is the jewel and it's like i kind of want you to be thinking more about the piece of jewelry that he's holding at the end of the first episode than you are like whether or not aliens are going to attack you know because i think that's a million times more interesting can we please focus on the dilemma at hand which greatly concerns my dignity should i go or not it's not about you it's about astraeus exactly you're being melodramatic my involvement in this war has been very polarizing okay, here we go one public misstep from me could compromise everything i'll be there buttering up the warhawks ahead of the summit they aren't what bothers me just arrived for you. From who? The capital, I think. <sighs> Leave it outside my room. Ah, uh, not so fast. Give it here, Borsha. Uh, but- Don't you dare. Dare what? Damn it, alien. <laughs> oh, no, would you look at that? Wow. <laughs> no, 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 no. What's wrong? <laughs> not your style. I don't have the energy for this. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful suit. You're kidding me. Oh, so rich in color. A bit too rich. Oh, and look at this embroidery. Oh, such immaculate gold threading. You must be joking. Don't you just love it, Chartreuse? I guess it didn't come in black. Give me that. Hey, hey, hey. He's obviously messing with me. This is the gaudiest thing imaginable. The first episode of The Madness of Truly is called The Starbringer Gifts, and we get a lot of exposition here in this first episode, which is typical, right? We need to know what's going on. We get to meet Chartrullian, this messiah figure. We also get to learn that he has recently ended this war with these aliens called the Rao, and the Rao are coming to meet with humanity for a diplomatic uh, end to the war to negotiate peace. We also learn that Chartrillion is kind of on the outs with a lot of his own society and that uh, he's worried about this thing called the Berserker, which is infecting the nine ships and himself. We get to meet some of the, the pilots of the ships. And the whole thing concludes really with the fact that Chartrillion has been invited to this grand ball, which is a celebration of the end of the war, as well as welcoming the diplomats from the Rao. He's expected to attend and socialize and mingle with the the most powerful people in human society. And he really doesn't want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, there there are a lot of things. I, I feel like if I was to go back in time, in the back of my mind, I'm always like, well, maybe there's things about this first episode I could have done differently. I gave it a lot of thought. There was some concession where like, I need to get the story going. I know this isn't going to be perfect. But also, I felt like the contrast was really fun to have all this hubbub kind of on, on the front, you know, with all this diplomacy and kind of like in all this, these story dealings that are these story details and things that are going on and to have the sticking point be for him, be what he was going to wear to the party. Right. <laughs> to me, there was something funny about that, but also kind of real because I feel like even when we are going to go do something monumental, like our brains are stuck in the weeds of how we're going to present, how we're going to you know, walk into the room, what we're going to say, the public's perception of us. So to me, in a way, it's not really so much about what he's going to wear. It's more so like an allegory of how he's going to fit into society. Right. Yeah. And, and the fact that he feels outcast and that he doesn't belong and that he doesn't have anything in common with these people. And he actually is rather contemptuous of most of them. You know. Exactly. You know, and it, which I thought, you know, just in general, having a messiah who really kind of has his closed off outlook was <laughs> incredibly interesting. Like, I don't want to be like, would Jesus want to go to the party? You know, but like, in a way, it was kind of like, would Jesus want to go to the party? You know, like, really, I, I, <laughs> I don't think he would. You know, if you have someone who is like of this incredibly kind of humble mindset, then suddenly they have to go into this really kind of contrived setting and suddenly put on this performance that like they're not prepared for. I felt like that would be a place that we can leave people that they could relate. And that is one of the main things people remember about the show was the stupid robes he got. Talk to me about your world building and what your approach to it is and how you want to draw people into your fictional creation. The world building is kind of like a, a moving train that's on fire a little bit. Like I, it's, it sounds really weird to say it that way, but a lot of classic sci-fi really kind of lays out their stuff in this way where you are kind of hit with, you know, a lot of information, a lot of info dubs, a lot of these story details that you can sink your teeth into. 
I just kind of did it. It came out. It, I didn't like have like much of a dictionary or anything like open. I wasn't really tracking these things. It, it's kind of just something that happened. And that's why I kind of say it's a moving, you know, flaming train a little bit because I feel like the world is going places faster than my brain can really track. I think what's happening is like I put all these things in there and I feel like one of two things happen. One, people hear it and they say, well, it's a lot. This is not for me. On one hand, that's unfortunate. But if you don't like it in the first episode, you're not going to like it for the rest of the series. <laughs> the other thing that happens is that people are like, whoa, give me more of this. Yeah. And they really want to sink their teeth in. They want to know more than what I provided. And there's kind of like this back end panic a little bit for me to fill in definitions and like really connect the dots on story elements and places and and characters and things like that. It's probably more world building that is really necessary for this kind of medium. But I think it's there to support whatever form the story takes, like moving forward. Yeah, that is one of the challenges. Like with with a novel, if you forget what a word means or a place is, you can kind of skip back and reread and, and remind yourself things like that. That's a little trickier with audio drama. I mean, it's mm-hmm. not as easy to. I mean, you can, but it's not as you know, it's not a convenient. I think to sort of rewind. What I like about the way you do it is that you don't overly explain it. It's there, and usually through context, you can kind of figure out what's going on. And people use these words in ordinary conversation, like they would in if they were actually talking. I kind of go by a rule of three in a way where if it's mentioned a couple of times, you know what the word is and you're looking for a definition. And so I did a lot of planting where I would bring something up the next time it was brought up. It was a little, you know, more seriously. Mm. But by the third time it's brought up, they're talking about what it is. I feel like because we're so used to consuming things that are like spoon fed to us, like over and over and over, you know, we're expecting things to be so on the nose that they're overly explained to us that when something comes at us that we actually have to think and we actually have to listen and we actually have to pull things from. I think that's something not a lot of audio drama listeners are really expecting A lot of people listen to audio dramas like in the background or while they're working or while they're doing laundry or something, you know, Mm -hmm. that's how people, a lot of people watch TV. You kind of put it on and then you do whatever else you're going to be doing. And and that's one of the reasons that TV is the way is designed the way it is. It's like, you know, the musical cues happen before the action so that the audience knows to look up and pay attention so they can see the action. Yeah. And I, I felt like I didn't want to make that. I feel like if you're a creator and you're putting your work and your energy into something, you don't really want it to be something that people just consume the background and then forget about. Right. You want to make something that people discuss and that they remember and that they come back to, even if they have to, like a lot of my listeners, like they'll come back to listen to story details, but they come back and they're the ones that are like really wanting to focus on it and like get into it. That's what I would want. It's what I do want. Like, is that level of listener who's who's engaged. I don't like this kind of culture of feeling like we have to just make a bunch of compelling things to play in the background of our lives. Like I, I feel like that's a waste of time and creativity. You've got some really amazing sound design and music. I mean, it's it's really sumptuous. Can you talk to me a little bit about your philosophy of sound design? And, and you must spend a lot of time developing this. It didn't always sound great. You know, from its earliest iterations, I kind of tried like a single reader performance just so I can hear the words spoken. And this was like kind of in the earliest days of the production cycle where I wanted to see if this was something I wanted to do. And then it kind of went from there where I, you know, had some friends and some Fiverr VOs um, kind of fill in some of the secondary parts. And then I was able to kind of put it together more like a scene, like more that I was more like I was used to from like film editing. And then the third iteration was really kind of just building on that to kind of explore some more conceptual sound design. And I didn't know anything really about sound design. I, at the beginning of this process was and still am a commercial editor for video. Like years ago, I kind of just like fallen into this like apathy a little bit of thinking that that's someone else's job like I'm going to stay in my lane in my pocket because you know that's not for me to explore from a career standpoint and so I'd actually said at some point maybe multiple times that I cannot sound design 
I'm laughing because uh, it's astonishing, honestly. Um, you know, Chartrillian sounds amazing. Well, it, you know, uh, there's a couple things to keep in mind there. One is that I've been pressing buttons in media for a long time, and I had a lot of support from people who actually knew what they were doing. I think the other thing about me is that just my general learning curve is pretty fast. And so like when I go and I'm going to learn something, I learn the crap out of it. And the other kind of huge part of that was collaborating with Sean Renner, who is the composer of the show. You and I have talked a lot about trying to make a career in the audio drama field. We've shared struggles and frustrations, as well as achievements and victories with each other. How do you feel about this artistic world that we're in, the way it's set up, the people that are working in it? What are your thoughts about this idea of a career? I, I kind of have this contentious opinion that I don't really feel like audio drama works well as a podcast. So a lot of the tools that are really useful for podcasters to generate revenue and stuff like that are a lot harder for especially independent audio dramas to leverage. Mm. And then we also have, you know, a lot of these bigger companies and these bigger production houses making great work. What has the risk of happening is a lot of the independents that are really wonderful will be at risk of not being found or as easily discoverable. You know, the tools that we're making podcasts discoverable, you know, are becoming either oversaturated or ending up behind paywalls and, and mm. stuff like that. Yeah. I think it's actually more of a social barrier. From what I have seen, the people that have the farthest reach are the people who are really good at networking, who are really good at meeting other creators and finding ways to kind of lift one another up. Any creators that feel like, hey, I want to support you, we'll do for like promo swaps and feed drops, like that kind of provide that support for people to meet other people and kind of amplify one another is like really important. How do you measure success? Uh, I've been thinking about this damn question. <laughs> I think it's a little disturbing because I don't really have an answer. I feel like for me, success is this kind of like formless, evolving thing. It's just having a thing that exists and having done it, you know, on like that kind of like human level of just having accomplished something. Anything beyond that, I kind of have a problem where I have a hard time being satisfied. I, you know, I have a hard time keeping the, the positive in perspective. And I, I, it's not just the positive, but everything. You know, I can receive the best news one day and then suddenly feel very small. Like I've tried to make milestones to be like, oh, if we reach 30,000 downloads, you know, then X. So if I reach 50,000 downloads, then X, you know, but then I've reached those milestones and kind of just been like, that system of reward is not doing it for me. A good measure of success for me will probably be the moment that I'm not hyper fixated on it, where I feel comfortable enough with something to walk away from it. I always say that I have border collie energy where I just always have to be engaged. I have to be hurting the project in some way. And it's not really a healthy way to expend energy. And, you know, sometimes I wind up very exhausted because I spend a lot of energy doing nothing but worrying about things. I feel like the moment I can put that aside, that's probably where I'm going to be like, okay, I succeeded. The last time I was in a crowd was the day of my exile. All the people of Simitu had gathered in the streets to exacerbate my humiliation. They called me an abomination. Abomination. Monster. But it wasn't the words or the stones that they threw that cut. It was the realization that I could hurt. And I could, I could hate. Hate. I could hate. Everything I did was for them. But they were blind. Will people tonight remember me as the monster? Or am I different in their eyes now? It may take more than this technicolor frock to disguise what I really am. The madness of Chartrullian is often compared to epic works like Dune or Foundation, dealing with high-level political themes. The show is buoyed by strong voice performances and sound design. It's a story rich in lore and philosophical themes that rewards listeners seeking a thoughtful, detailed experience. You can listen to The Madness of Chartrullian on most major podcast platforms, or see our show notes for more information. 
The first episode of is written and produced by W. Keith Timms. All the opinions expressed in this show belong to the people who expressed them and not necessarily to anyone else. The theme song is Mockingbird by David Mumford. This show is a production of Alien Ghost Robot Creative Media. If you want more information, want to sign up for our newsletter, or are an audio drama creator and would like to be on the show, visit our website at thefirstepisodeof.com. We're happy to be a part of the Audio Drama Lab, a Discord-based resource for audio drama development and networking. Check it out at audiodramalab.com. Keep telling stories. It's the only way we're going to get out of this mess. Until next time. Hey, it's Keith. And if you're like me, not only do you like audio drama, but you enjoy puzzles and games, which is why I want to let you know about Wongo Puzzles. They're high quality, handcrafted, and perfect for anyone who loves a good challenge, but doesn't want to dedicate their entire kitchen table to puzzles for a week. These things are beautiful. They're 100% wooden puzzles that last forever. Each piece is hand-drawn, so no two pieces are the same. And you'll discover some fun, whimsy pieces as you work through it. They come in a custom wooden box, which is perfect for storage and gifting. I think my favorite is the snow globe. Really pretty. So what are you waiting for? Go to wongopuzzles.com and pick your puzzle today. And be sure to use the promo code TFEO to get 10% off your order. This is the most fun you've had with a puzzle guaranteed or your money back. Go to W-O-N-G-O puzzles.com and use the code TFEO to get 10% off your order and get puzzling right now. I know you got questions about him. Where did he come from? How did he do all those things they say he did? Was he a terrorist? Was he crazy? Was his skin really blue? Well... I'll tell you what I know. I was there with him, driving through the back roads under the stars. I was witness to wonders and miracles, and to the darkness that's coursing through the veins of our country. He came to fight it in his own strange way, but no one leaves that fight unchanged. Not even Rael. People ought to know the truth. And I was there. The Book of Constellations is a down-to-earth sci-fi road trip. It's audio fiction, and you can find episodes at bookofconstellations.com or wherever you get your podcasts.